Okay. Chapter 22. The Ordeal of Reconstruction. 1865 to 1877. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right of God gives us to see the right. Let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Abraham Lincoln, his second inaugural address, March 4, 1865. The battle was done, the burglars silent, the buglers silent. Bone weary and bloody, the American people, north and south, now face the staggering challenges of peace. Four questions loom large. How would the South, physically devastated by war and socially revolutionized by emancipation, be rebuilt? How would the liberated blacks fare as free men and women? How would the southern states be reintegrated to the Union? And who would direct the process of reconstruction? The southern states themselves, the president, or Congress? Problems of peace. Other questions also clamored for answers. What should be done with the captured Confederate ringleaders, all of whom were liable to charges of treason? During the war, a popular northern song had been, Hang Jeff Davis on the sour apple tree! And even innocent children had lisped Davis was temporarily collapsed in iron during the early days of his two-year imprisonment, but he and his fellow conspirators were finally released, partly because the odds were that no Virginia jury would convict him. All rebel leaders were finally pardoned by President Johnson as a sort of Christmas present in 1868, but Congress did not remove all remaining civil disabilities until 30 years later and only posthumously restored Davis's citizenship more than a century later. Dismal indeed was the picture presented by the war-wracked South when the rattle of musketry faded. Not only had an aged parish, but a civilization had collapsed in both its economic and its social structure. The moonlight and magnolia Old South, largely imaginary in any case, had forever gone with the wind. Handsome cities of yesteryear, such as Charleston and Richmond, were rubble-strewn and weed-choked, and Atlantan returned to his once fair hometown and remarked, Hell has laid her egg, and right here it hatched. Economic life had creaked to a halt. Banks and business houses had locked their doors, ruined by runaway inflation. Factories were smokeless, silent, dismantled. The transportation system had broken down completely. Before the war, five different railroad lines had converged on Columbia, South Carolina. Now the nearest connected track was 29 miles away. Efforts to untwist the rails corkscrewed by Sherman soldiers proved bumpily unsatisfactorily. Agriculture, the economic lifeblood of the South, was hopelessly crippled. Once white cotton fields now yielded a lush harvest of nothing but green weeds. The slave labor system had collapsed, seed was scarce, and livestock had been driven off by the plundering Yankees. Pathetic instances were reported of men hitching themselves to plows while women and children gripped the handles. Not until 1870 did the seceded states produce as large a cotton crop as did that fateful year of 1860, and much of that yield came from the new acreage in the Southwest. The princely manor aristocrats were humbled by the war, at least temporarily. Reduced to proud poverty, they faced charred and gutted mansions, lost investments in almost worthless land. Their investments of more than $2 billion in slaves, their primary form of wealth, had evaporated with emancipation. Beaten but unbent, many high-spirited white Southerners remained dangerously defiant. They cursed the damn Yankees and spoke of your government in Washington instead of our government. One Southern bishop refused to pray for President Andrew Johnson, though Johnson proved to be in sore need of divine guidance. Conscious of no crime, these former Confederates continued to believe that their view of secession was correct and that the lost cause was still a just war. One popular anti-union song ran, I'm glad I fought a gainer. I only wish we'd won. I ain't ax any pardon for anything I've done. Such attitudes boded ill for the prospects of painlessly binding up the Republic's wounds. Freedmen defined freedom. Confusion abounded in the still smoldering South about the present precise meaning of freedom for blacks. Emancipation took effect haughtily, Hot, haltedly, and unevenly in different parts of the conquered Confederacy. As Union armies marched in and out of various localities, many blacks found themselves emancipated and then re-enslaved. A North Carolina Lion slave estimated that he had been celebrated freedom about 12 times. Blacks from one Texas county fleeing to the free soil of the liberated county next door were attacked by slave owners as they swam across the river that marked the county line. The next day, trees along the riverbank were bent with swinging corpses, a grisly warning to others dreaming of liberty. Other planters resisted emancipation more legalistically, stubbornly protesting that slavery was lawful until the state legislatures or the Supreme Court declared otherwise. For many slaves, the shackles of bondage were not struck off in a single mighty blow. 
long-suffering blacks often had to rush free of the chains link by link. The variety of responses to emancipation by whites as well as blacks illustrated the sometimes startling complexity of the master-slave relationship. Loyalty to the plantation master prompted some slaves to resist the liberating Union armies, while other slaves' pent-up bitterness burst forth violently on the day of liberation. Many newly emancipated slaves, for example, joined Union troops in pillaging their master's possessions. In one instance, a group of Virginia slaves laid 20 lashes on the back of their former master, a painful dose of his own favorite medicine. Prodded by the bayonets of the Yankee armies of occupation, all masters were eventually forced to recognize their slaves as permanent freedom. The once commanding planter would assemble his former human chattels in front on the front porch of the big house and announce their liberty. Though some blacks initially responded to news of their emancipation with suspicion or uncertainty, they soon celebrated their newfound freedom. Many took new names in places of the ones given by their masters and demanded that whites formally address them as Mr. or Mrs., Others abandoned the coarse cottons that had been their only clothing as slaves and sought silks, satins, and other finery. Though many whites perceived such behavior as insubordinate, they were forced to recognize the realities of emancipation. Never before had I a word of impotence from any other of our black folk, wrote one southern white southerner, but they are not ours any longer. Tens of thousands of emancipated blacks took to the roads, some to test their freedoms, others to search for long-lost spouses, parents, and children. Emancipation thus strengthened the black family, and many newly freed men and women formalized slave marriages for personal and pragmatic reasons, including the desire to make their children legal heirs. Other blacks left their former masters to work in towns and cities, where existing black communities provided protection and mutual assistance. Whole communities sometimes moved together in search of opportunity. From 1878 to 1880, some 25,000 blacks from Louisiana, Texas, and Mississippi surged in a mass exodus to Kansas. The westward floods of these exodusters was stemmed only when steamboat captains refused to transport more black migrants across the Mississippi River. The church became the focus of black community life in the years following emancipation. As slaves, blacks as slaves, blacks had worshipped alongside whites, but now they formed their own churches, pastored by their own ministers. Black the black churches they grew up robustly. The one hundred and fifty thousand member Black Baptist Church of eighteen fifty reached five hundred thousand by eighteen seventy, while the African Methodist Episcopal Church quadrupled in size from a hundred thousand to four hundred thousand in the first decade after emancipation. These churches formed the bedrock of black community life, and they soon gave rise to other benevolent, fraternal, and mutual aid societies. All these organizations helped blacks protect their newly won freedom. Now, emancipation also meant education for many blacks. Learning to read and write had been privileged generally denied to them under slavery. Freedom, freedmen wasted no time in establishing societies for self-improvement, which undertook to raise funds to purchase land, build schoolhouses, and hire teachers. One member of a North Carolina education society asserted that, quote, a schoolhouse would be the first proof of their independence, unquote. Southern blacks soon found, however, that the demand outstripped the supply of qualified black teachers. They accepted the aid of northern white women sent by the American Missionary Association who volunteered their services as teachers. They also turned to the federal government for help. The free blacks were going to need all the friends and the power they could muster in Washington. Quick pause here, just a few terms. Um, freedmen is the term for slaves that are now free. The Freedmen's Bureau. Abolitionists had long preached that slavery was a degrading institution. Now the emancipators were faced with the brutal reality that the freedmen were overwhelmingly unskilled, unlettered, without property or money, and with scant knowledge of how to survive as free people. To cope with this problem throughout the conquered South, Congress created the Freedmen's Bureau on March 3, 3, 1865. On paper, at least, the Bureau was intended to be a kind of primitive welfare agency. It was to provide food, clothing, medical care, and education both to freedmen and to white refugees. Head in the Bureau was a warmly sympathetic friend of the blacks, Union General Oliver O. Howard, who later founded the, and served as president of Howard University in Washington, D.C. The Bureau achieved its greatest success in education. It taught an estimated 200,000 blacks how to read. Many former slaves had a passion for learning, partly because they wanted to close the gap between themselves and the whites, and partly because they longed to read the Word of God. In one elementary class in North Carolina sat four generations of the same family, ranging from six, a six-year-old child to a 75-year-old grandmother. But in other areas, the Bureau's accomplishments were meager or even mischievous. Altogether, the Bureau was authorized to settle former slaves on 40-acre tracts confiscated from the Confederates. Little land actually made it to the blacks' hands. Instead, local administrators often collaborated with planters in expelling the blacks from towns and cajoling them into signing labor contracts to work for their former masters. Still, the white southern South resented the Bureau as a meddlesome federal interloper that threatened to upset white racial dominance. 
President Andrew Johnson, who shared the white supremacist views of most white Southerners, repeatedly tried to kill it, and it expired in 1872. So it had a great success. The Freedmen's Bureau had great success in education, but in little other else. Johnson, the Taylor president. Few presidents have ever been faced with a more perplexing sea of troubles than confronting Andrew Johnson. What manner of man was this medium-billed, dark-eyed, black-haired Tennessean, now chief executive by virtue of the bullet that killed Lincoln? No citizen, not even Lincoln, had ever reached the White House from humbler beginnings. Born to impoverished parents in North Carolina and early orphaned, Johnson never attended school but was apprenticed to a tailor at age 10. Ambitious to get ahead, he taught himself to read, and later his wife taught him to write and do simple arithmetic. Like many another self-made man, he was inclined to overpraise his maker. Johnson early became active in politics in Tennessee, where he had moved to when moved when 17 years old. He shone as an impassioned champion of the poor whites against planter aristocrats, although he himself ultimately owned a few slaves. He excelled as a two-fisted stump speaker before angry and heckling crowds who on occasion greeted his political oratory with cocked pistols, not just cocked ears. Elected to Congress, he attracted much favorable attention in the North, but not the South, when he refused to secede with his own state. After Tennessee was partially redeemed by Union armies, he was appointed war governor and served courageously in an atmosphere of danger. Political exigency next thrust Johnson into the vice presidency. Lincoln's Union Party in 1864 needed to attract support from the war Democrats and other pro-Southern elements, and Johnson, a Democrat, seemed to be the ideal man. Unfortunately, he appeared at the vice presidential inaugural ceremony the following March in a scandalous condition. He had recently been afflicted with typhoid fever, and although not known at Although not known as a heavy drinker, he was urged by his friends to take a stiff bracer of whiskey, and then he did, with unfortunate results. Basically, he showed up drunk to the inaugural and gave a speech after him drinking a bunch. Old Andy, Johnson, was no doubt a man of parts, unpolished parts. He was intelligent, able, forceful, and gifted with homespun honesty. Steadfastly devoted to the duty and to the people, he was a dogmatic champion of states' rights and the Constitution. He would often present a copy of the document to visitors, and he was buried on his pillow. Yet the man who raised himself from the tailor's bench to the president's chair was a misfit, a Southerner who did not understand the North, a Tennessean who had earned the distrust of the South, a Democrat who had never been accepted by the Republicans, a president who had never been elected to office. He was not at home in a Republican White House. Hot-headed, contentious, and stubborn, he was the wrong man in the wrong place at the wrong time. A Reconstruction policy devised by angels might well have failed in his tactless hands. Now, as we head to the next section here, we're going to read about presidential Reconstruction, uh, and then we're also going to hear about congressional or radical Reconstruction. So just as you read, keep in mind the two frames. First was presidential Reconstruction, and then a more radical form of Reconstruction uh, controlled by Congress. And this is Congress controlled by the Republicans. So presidential Reconstruction. Even before the shooting war had ended, the political war over Reconstruction had begun. Abraham Lincoln believed that the southern states had never legally withdrawn from the Union. Their formal restoration to the Union would therefore be relatively simple. Accordingly, Lincoln, in 1863, pro proclaimed his 10% Reconstruction Plan. 10% Reconstruction Plan. It decreed that a state could be reintegrated into the Union when 10% of its voters... Uh, in the presidential election of 1860, had taken the oath of allegiance to the United States and pledged to abide by emancipation. The next step would be formal uh, erection of a state government, and Lincoln would then recognize the purified regime. Lincoln's proclamation provoked a sharp reaction in Congress, where Republicans feared the restoration of the planter aristocracy to power and the possible re-enslavement of the blacks. Republicans therefore ran through Congress in 1864 the Wade Davis Bill. It required that 50% of state voters take the oath of office and demanded stronger safeguards for emancipation than Lincoln's as the price of readmission. Lincoln pocket vetoed this bill by refusing to sign it after Congress had adjourned. Republicans were outraged. They refused to seat delegates from Louisiana after that state had reorganized its government in accordance with Lincoln's 10% plan in 1864. The controversy surrounding the Wade Davis bill had revealed deep differences between the president and Congress. Unlike Lincoln, many, Lincoln, many in Congress insisted that the seceders had indeed left the Union and had, quote, committed suicide as Republican states and had therefore forfeited all their rights. They could be readmitted only as conquered provinces on such conditions as Congress should decree. The episode further revealed differences among Republicans. Two factions were emerging. The majority moderate group tended to agree with Lincoln that the seceded states should be restored to the Union as simply and as swiftly as reasonable. 
though on Congress's terms, not the president's. The minority radical group believed that the South should atone more painfully for its sins. Before the South should be restored, the radicals wanted its social structure uprooted, the haughty planters punished, and the newly emancipated blacks protected by federal power. I'm going to pause here for just a minute. One thing you'll notice, there's this moderate majority who, whether they swing towards the president or swing towards the radicals, could uh, have a lot of power in Congress. And what we're going to see is the behavior of the Southerners make uh, them look bad, basically, and drive the more moderates into the radicals' uh, camp. And therefore, for a while, you're going to see some radical things. So you're going to see the moderate Republicans um, have the control as they can, wh whichever side they go to, uh, they can they will shape the day. So right now, the moderates support the president and Lincoln's more moderate plan. But then as Southerners behave badly, they're going to drive them into the radicals. Let's go back to the reading. Some of the radicals were secretly pleased when the assassin's bullet felled Lincoln, for the martyred president had shown tenderness toward the South. Spiteful Andy Johnson, who shared their hatred for the planter aristocrats, would presumably also share their desire to reconstruct the South with a rod of iron. Johnson soon disillusioned them. He agreed with Lincoln that the seceded states had never legally been outside the Union. Thus, he quickly recognized several of Lincoln's 10% governments, and on May 24, 1865, he issued his own Reconstruction Proclamation. It disenfranchised certain leading Confederates, including those with taxable property more, uh, worth more than 20000 though they might petition him for personal pardons. It called for a special state convention, which were required to repeal the Ordinance of Secession, repudiate all Confederate debts, and ratify the slave-freeing 13th Amendment. States that complete, complied with these conditions, Johnson declared, would be swiftly readmitted to the Union. Johnson, savoring his dominance over the high-toned aristocrats who now begged for his favor, granted pardons in abundance. Bolstered by the political resurrection of the planter elite, the recently rebellious states moved rapidly into the second half of 1865 to organize governments. But as a pattern of all the new governments became clear, Republicans of all stripes grew furious. So, President Johnson, lenient like Lincoln, things are going smoothly, we're going to have a new, we're going to readmit the South back in, but the the patterns of these new governments and the behavior of these new governments make Republicans, moderate, and radicals furious and want to dig their heels in. The Baleful Black Codes Among the first actions of the new Southern regimes, sanctioned by Johnson, was the passage of the Iron Tooth Black Codes. These laws were designed to regulate the affairs of the emancipated blacks, much as the slave statutes had done in pre-Civil War days. Mississippi passed the first such law in November of 1865, and other southern states soon followed suit. The black codes varied in severity from state to state. Mississippi's was the harshest and Georgia's the most lenient, but they had much in common. The black codes aimed, first of all, to ensure a stable and subservient labor force. The crushed king cotton kingdom <clears throat> could not rise from its weeds until the fields were once again put under the hoe and plow, and many whites wanted to make sure that they retained their tight control they had exercised over black field hands and plow drivers in the days of slavery. Remember, going back, slavery was essentially an economic uh, role, and the, slave, the race thing became a convenient justification for it. Dire penalties were therefore imposed by the codes on blacks who, quote, jumped their labor contracts, which usually committed them to work for the same employer for one year and generally at pittance wages. Violators could be made to forfeit back wages or could be forcibly dragged back to work by the paid Negro catcher. In Mississippi, the captured freedmen could be fined and then hired out to pay their fines, an arrangement that closely resembled its slavery itself. The codes also sought to restore as nearly as possible the pre-emancipation system of race relations. Freedom was legally recognized, as were some of the privileges, such as the right to marry, but all the codes forbade a black to serve on a jury. Some even bar blacks from renting or leasing land. A black could be punished for idleness by being sentenced to work on a chain gang. Nowhere were blacks allowed to vote. <clears throat> These oppressive laws mocked the idea of freedom, so recently purchased by buckets of blood. The black codes imposed terrible burdens on the unfettered blacks, struggling against mistreatment and poverty to make their way as free people. The worst features of the black codes would eventually be repealed, but their revocation could not by itself lift the liberated blacks into economic independence. Lacking capital, money, and with little to offer but their labor, thousands of impoverished former slaves slipped into status of sharecropper farmers, as did many land as whites. Luckless sharecroppers gradually sank into morass of virtual peonage and remained there for generations. Formerly slaves to masters, countless blacks as well as poor whites, in effect became slaves to the soil and to their creditors, those who were lending them money. 
Yet the dethroned planter aristocracy resented even this pitiful concession to freedom. Sharecropping was the wrong policy, said one planter. It makes the laborer too independent. He becomes a partner and has a right to be consulted. The black codes made an ugly impression in the North. If the former slaves were being re-enslaved, people asked one another, had not the boys in blue spilled their blood in vain? Had the North really won the war? Now time for congressional reconstruction. These questions grew more insistent when the congressional delegations from the newly reconstituted southern states presented themselves in the Capitol in December of 1865. To the shock and disgust of the Republicans, many former, former Confederate leaders were on hand to claim their seats. The appearance of these ex-rebels was a natural but costly blunder. Voters of the South seeking able representative have turned instinctively to their experienced statesmen, but most of the southern leaders were tainted by active association with the lost cause. Among them were four former Confederate generals, five colonels, and various members of the Richmond cabinet and Congress. Worst of all, there was the shrimply but brainy Alexander Stevens, ex-vice president of the Confederacy, still under indictment for treason. The presence of these whitewashed rebels infuriated the Republicans in Congress. The war had been fought to restore the Union, but not on these kind of terms. The Republicans were in no hurry to embrace their former enemies, virtually all of them Democrats, in the chambers of the Capitol. While the South had been out from 1861 to 1865, the Republicans in Congress had enjoyed a relatively free hand. They had passed much legislation that favored the North, such as the Morrill Tariff, High Tariff, the Pacific Railroad Act, and the Homestead Act. Now many Republicans balked at giving up this political advantage. On the first day of the Congressional session, December 4, 1865, they banged shut the door in the face of the newly elected Southern delegations. Looking to the future, the Republicans were alarmed to realize that a restored South would be stronger than ever in national politics. Why is this? Before the war, a black slave had counted as three-fifths of a person in a portion in congressional representation. Now the slave was five-fifths of a person. Eleven Southern states had seceded and had been subdued by force of arms, but, but now, owing to full counting of free blacks, the rebel states were entitled to 12 more votes in Congress and 12 more pres presidential electoral votes than they had previously enjoyed. Again, angry voices in the North raised the cry, who won the war? Republicans had good reason to fear that ultimately they might be elbowed aside. Southerners might join hands with Democrats in the North and win control of Congress, or maybe even the White House. If this happened, they could perpetuate the black codes, virtually re-enslaving the blacks. They could dismantle the economic program of the Republican Party by lowering tariffs, rerouting the Transcontinental Railroad, repealing the Free Farm Homestead Act, possibly even repudiating the national debt. President Johnson thus deeply disturbed the Congressional Republicans when he announced on December 6, 1865, that the recently rebellious states had satisfied the conditions and that, the new, in his view, the Union was now restored. Johnson clashes with Congress. A clash between the President and Congress was now inevitable. It exploded into the open in February 1866, when the President vetoed a bill, later repassed, extending the life of the controversial Freedmen's Bureau. Aroused, the Republicans swiftly struck back. In December, I'm sorry, in March of 1866, they passed the Civil Rights Bill, which conferred on blacks the privilege of American citizenship and struck at the black codes. President Johnson resolutely vetoed this forward-looking measure on constitutional grounds, but in April, Congress, Congressman steamrolled it over, right over his veto, something that repeatedly, they repeatedly did henceforth. The hapless president dubbed Sir Vito and Andy Vito had his presidential wings clipped as Congress increasingly assumed the dominant role in running the government. One critic called Johnson the dead dog of the White House. The Republicans now undertook to rivet the principles of the Civil Rights Bill into the Constitution as the 14th Amendment. They feared that Southerners might one day win control of Congress and repeal the hated law. The proposed amendment, as approved by Congress and sent to the states in June 1866, was sweeping. It, one, conferred civil rights, including citizenship, but excluding the franchise vote on the freedmen. Two, reduced proportionally the representation of a state in Congress and in the Electoral College if it denied blacks to the ballot. And three, disqualified from federal and state office of former Confederates who as federal office holders had once sworn to the support to the Constitution of the United States, and then four, guaranteed the federal debt while repudiating all Confederate debts. The radical faction was disappointed that the 14th Amendment did not grant the right to vote, but all Republicans agreed that no state should be welcomed back into the Union fold, in the Union fold without first ratifying the 14th Amendment. Yet President Johnson advised that the southern states to reject it, and all the sinful eleven except Tennessee defiantly spurned the amendment. Their spirit was reflected in a southern song, and I don't want no pardon for what I was am. I don't 
I don't, I don't want no pardon for what I was or am. I won't be reconstructed, and I don't give a damn. So the 14th Amendment, if just pause, is a pretty huge huge deal. It's the first time where they tried to create a unified national citizen that enjoyed all the same rights regardless of what state you were in, uh, and you could not deny people citizenship rights based on their color. <clears throat> Swinging round the circle with Johnson. <clears throat> As 1866 lengthened, the battle grew between the Congress and the President. The root of the controversy was Johnson's 10% governments that had passed the most stringent black codes. Congress had tried to temper the worst features of the codes by extending the life of the embattled Freedmen's Bureau and passing the Civil Rights Bill. Both measures Johnson had vetoed. Now the issue was whether Reconstruction was to be carried on with, with or without the 14th Amendment. The Republicans would settle for nothing less. The crucial Congress congressional elections of 1866, more crucial than some presidential elections, was fast approaching. Johnson was naturally eager to escape from the clutch of Congress by securing a major, I'm sorry, majority favorable to his soft on South policy. Invited to dedicate a Chicago monument to Stephen A. Douglas, he undertook to speak at various cities en route in support of his views. Johnson's famous swing round the circle, beginning in the late summer of 1866, was a serial comedy of errors. The president delivered a series of give him hell speeches in which he, he accused the radicals in Congress of having planned large-scale anti-black riots and murder in the South. As he spoke, hecklers hurled insults at him. Reverting to his stump-speaking days in Tennessee, he shouted back angry retorts amid cries of, You be damned! and Don't get mad, Andy! The dignity of his high office sank, sank into a new low as the old charges of drunkenness were revived. As a vote-getter, Johnson was highly successful. For the opposition, he is inept speech-making, heightened the cry, stand by Congress against the tailor of the Potomac. When the ballots were counted, the Republicans had rolled up more than two-thirds majority of both houses of Congress. Republican Principles and Programs The Republicans now had a veto-proof Congress and virtually unlimited control of Reconstruction policy, but moderates and radicals still disagreed over the best course to pursue in the South. The radicals in the Senate were led by the courtly and principled idealist Charles Sumner, Massachusetts, the long since recovered from his pre-war caning on the Senate floor, who tirelessly labored not only for black freedom, but for racial equality. In the House, the most powerful radical was Thaddeus Stevens, crusty and vindictive congressman from Pennsylvania. Seventy-four years old in 1866, he was a curious figure with protruding lower lip, a heavy black wig covering his bald head, and a deformed foot. An unswerving friend of blacks, he had defended runaway slaves in court without fee and, before dying, insisted on burial in a black ceremony, cemetery. His affectionate devotion to blacks was matched by his vitriolic hatred of rebellious Southern white Southerners, a masterly parliamentarian with razor-sharp mind and withering wit. Stevens was a leading figure on the Joint House-Senate Committee on Reconstruction. So, just a quick pause, you got, in the Senate, you have Charles Sumner from Massachusetts, he was the guy that got beat by the cane before the war, and you got Thaddeus Stevens in the House, both radical re Republicans who want a, a much more punishing version on the South. Still opposed to rapid restoration of the Southern states, the radicals wanted to keep them out as long as possible and apply federal power to bring about a drastic social and economic transformation in the South. But moderate Republicans, more attuned to time-honored principles of states' rights and self-government, recoiled from the full implications of the radical program. They preferred policies that restrained the states from abridging citizens' rights, rather than policies that directly involved the federal government in the individual lives. The actual policies adopted by Congress showed the influence of both these schools of thought, though the moderates, as the majority faction, had the upper hand. And one thing both groups had come to agree on by 1867 was the necessity to enfranchise black voters, even if it took federal troops to do it. Reconstruction by the Sword Against the backdrop of vicious and bloody race riots that had erupted in several southern cities, Congress passed the Reconstruction Act on March 2, 1867. Supplemented later by later measures, this drastic legislation divided the South into five military districts, each commanded by a Union general and policed by blue-clad soldiers, about 20,000 all told. The act also temporarily disenfranchised tens of thousands of former Confederates. So what you guys have is now a, a occupation of the South by Northern troops. Congress additionally laid down stringent conditions for the readmission of the seceded states. The wayward states were required to ratify the 14th Amendment, giving the former slaves their rights as citizens. The bitterest pill of all to white Southerners was the stipulation that they guarantee in their state constitutions full suffrage voting rights for their former adult male slaves. 
Yet the act, reflecting the modern moderate sentiment, stopped short of giving the freedmen land or education at federal expense. The overriding purpose of the moderates was to create an electorate in the southern states that would vote these states back into the Union on acceptable terms and thus free the federal government from direct responsibility for the protection of black rights. As later events would demonstrate, this approach proved woefully inadequate to the cause of justice for blacks. The radical Republicans were still worried. The danger loomed that once the unrepentant states were readmitted, they would amend their constitutions so as to withdraw the ballot from the blacks. The only ironclad safeguard was to incorporate black suffrage in the federal constitution. This goal was finally achieved with the 15th Amendment, passed by Congress in 1869 and ratified by the required number of states in 1870. Military reconstruction of the South not only usurped certain functions of the president as commander-in-chief, but set up a martial regime of dubious legality. Basically, it's a military occupation led by Congress. The commander-in-chief is usually the president, and so this is questionable by the Constitution. Back to the reading. The Supreme Court had already ruled in the case of Ex parte Milligan in 1866 that military tribunals could not try civilians, even during wartime, in areas where the civil courts were open. Peacetime military rules seemed starkly contrary to the spirit of the Constitution, but the circumstances were extraordinary in the Republic's history, and for the time being, the Supreme Court avoided offending the Republican Congress. Prodded into line by federal bayonets, the southern states got on with the task of Constitution-making. By 1870, all of them had reorganized their governments and had been accorded full rights. The hated bluebellies remained until the new, new Republican regimes, usually called radical regimes, appeared to be firmly entrenched. Yet, when the federal troops finally left the state, its government swiftly passed back into the hands of the white, quote, redeemers, or home rule regimes, which were inevitably democratic. Finally, in 1877, the last federal muskets were removed from the state politics, and the solid South, Democrat South, congealed. A quick pause before we go on. The redeemer term, the redeemers, are the belief that these are white Southerners who want to redeem the South back the way it was uh, for the whites. And you have, at this point a military occupation lasting until 1877 of the South, and you have three amendments that you should remember. You have the 13th, which uh, gave blacks their freedom, the 14th, which guaranteed their rights as citizens, uh, and the 15th, which gave them the right to vote. So you can think 13, 14, 15, free citizens vote. If you take a quick look on the next page on 490, you can see that there's the map. On the, on the right-hand side, you have the three various years. And once... The, while the Reconstruction troops were down in the South, the majority there was the blue there. They were Republicans, because presumably because black men could vote then, and they voted Republican. If you look at this, the 1876 map, when the troops were getting pulled out, they went solidly Democratic, which leads one to believe that the, as soon as the federal troops were gone, the blacks were being disenfranchised. And speaking of disenfranchised, the next section, No Women Voters. The passage of the three Reconstruction-era amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, delighted former abolitionists but deeply disappointed advocates of women's rights. Women had played a prominent role in the pre-war abolitionist movement and had often pointed out that both women and blacks lacked basic civil rights, especially the crucial right to vote. The struggle for the black freedom and the crusade for women's rights, therefore, were one and the same in the eyes of many women. Yet during the war, feminist leaders such as Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony had temporarily suspended their own demands and worked wholeheartedly for the cause of black emancipation. The Women's Loyal League had gathered nearly 400,000 signatures on petitions asking Congress to pass a constitutional amendment prohibiting slavery. Now, with the war ended and the 13th Amendment passed, feminist leaders believed that their time had come. They reeled with shock, however, when the wording of the 14th Amendment, which defined equal national citizenship, for the first time inserted the word male into the Constitution in referring to a citizen's right to vote. Both Stanton and uh, Anthony campaigned actively against the 14th Amendment, despite the pleas of federal Douglas, who had long supported women's suffrage, but believed that this was, quote, the Negro's hour. When the 15th Amendment proposed to prohibit denial of the vote on the basis of race, color, or previous condition of servitude, Stanton and Anthony wanted the word sex added to the list. They lost the battle, too. Fifty years would pass before the Constitution granted women the right to vote. The Realities of Radical Reconstruction in the South The blacks now had freedom, of a sort. Their friends in Congress had only haltingly and somewhat belatedly secured the franchise for them. Both Presidents Lincoln and Johnson had proposed to give the ballot gradually to selected blacks who qualified for it through education, property ownership, or military service. Moderate Republicans and even many radicals at first hesitated to bestow suffrage on the freedmen. 
the 14th Amendment, in many ways the heart of the Republican program for Reconstruction, had fallen short on guaranteeing the right to vote. It envisioned for blacks the same status of women, citizenship without voting rights. But by 1867, hesitation had given way to a hard determination to enfranchise the former slaves wholesale and immediately while thousands of white Southerners were being denied the vote. By glaring contrast, most of the northern states, before ratification of the 15th Amendment in 1870, withheld the ballot from their tiny black minorities. White Southerners naturally concluded that the Republicans were hypocritical in assisting that blacks in the South be allowed to vote. Having gained their right to suffrage, southern black men seized the initiative and began organizing politically. Their primary vehicle became the Union League, originally a pro-Union organization based in the North. Assisted by Northern blacks, Freedmen turned the League into a network of political clubs that educated members in their civic duties and campaigned for Republican candidates. The League's mission soon expanded to include building black churches and schools, representing black grievances before local employers and government, and recruiting militias to protect black communities from white retaliation, a real threat. Though African American women did not obtain the right to vote, they too assumed new political roles. Black women faithfully attended the parades and rallies common in black communities during the early years of Reconstruction and helped assemble mass meetings in the newly constructed black churches. They even showed up at the constitutional conventions held throughout the South in 1867, monitoring the proceedings and participating in informal votes outside the convention halls. But black men elected as delegates to the state constitutional conventions held the greater political authority. They formed the backbone of the black political community. At the conventions, they sat down with whites to hammer out new state constitutions, which most importantly provided the universal male suffrage. Voting rights. Though the subsequent elections produced no black governors or majorities in the state senates, black political participation expanded exponentially during Reconstruction. Between 1868 and 1876, 14 black congressmen and two black senators, Hiram Revels and Blanche Bruce, both of Mississippi, served in Washington, D.C., Blacks had also served in state governments as lieutenant governors and representatives, and in local governments as mayors, magistrates, sheriffs, and justices of the peace. The sight of former slaves holding office deeply offended their one-time masters, who lashed out with particularly fury at the freedmen's white allies, labeling them scalawags and carpetbaggers. The so-called scalawags were Southerners, often former Unionists and Whigs. The former Confederates accused them, often with wild exaggeration, of plundering the treasuries of the Southern states through their political influence in their radical governments. The carpetbaggers, on the other hand, were supposedly sleazy Northerners who had packed all their worldly goods into a carpetbag suitcase at the war's end and had come south to seek personal power and profit. In fact, most were former Union soldiers and Northern businessmen and professionals who wanted to play a role in modernizing, quote, the New South. How well did the radical regimes rule? The radical legislators passed much desirable legislation and introduced many many badly needed reforms. For the first time in Southern history, steps were taken toward establishing adequate public schools. Tax systems were streamlined, public works were launched, and property rights were guaranteed to women. Many welcome reforms were retained by the all-white, quote, redeemer governments that later returned to power. Despite these achievements, graft, corruption, ran rampant in many radical governments. This was especially true in South Carolina and Louisiana, where consciousness promoters and other pocket patters used politically inexperienced blacks as pawns. The worst black and white legislatures purchased as legislative supplies and stationaries as hams, perfumes, suspenders, bonnets, corsets, champagne, and a coffin. One thrifty carpetbagger um, government in a single year saved $100,000 from a salary of 8000 So there's one guy, this one governor, and, and one saved, quote-unquote, $100,000 from a salary where he was only supposedly making 8000 Yet the sort of corruption was by no means confined to the South in the pre-war years. The crimes of the Reconstruction governments were no more outrageous than the scams and felonies being perpetrated in the North at the same time, especially in Boss Tweed's New York. We'll talk about that in Chapter 23. The Ku Klux Klan Deeply embittered, some Southern whites resorted to savage measures against radical rule. Many whites resented the success and ability of black legislators as much as they resented alleged corruption. A number of secret organizations mushroomed forth, the most notorious of which was the Invisible Empire of the South, or the Ku Klux Klan, founded in Tennessee in 1866. Besheeted night riders, their horses' hoofs muffled, would approach the cabin of an upstart black and hammer on the door. In ghoulish tones, one thirsty horseman would demand a bucket of water. Then, under the presence of drinking, he would pour it into a rubber attachment concealed beneath his mask and gown, smack his lips, and declare that this was the first water he had tasted since he was killed at the Battle of Shiloh. 
If fright did not produce the desired effect, force was employed. Such tomfoolery and terror proved partially effective. Many ex-bobmen and white carpetbaggers, quick to take a, th- a hint, shunned the polls, meaning they didn't vote. Those stubborn souls who persisted in their upstart ways were flogged, mutilated, or even murdered. In one Louisiana parish in 1868, the whites in two days killed or wounded 200 victims. A pile of 25 bodies was found half-buried in the woods. By such atrocious practices were blacks, quote, kept in their place, that is, down. The clan became a refuge, refuge for numerous bandits and cutthroats. Any scoundrel could don a sheet. Congress, outraged by this night-riding lawlessness, passed the Harsh Force Acts of 1870 and 1871. Federal troops were able to stamp out much of the lash law, but by this time, the Invisible Empire had already done its work of intimidation. Many of the outlawed groups continued their tactics in the guise of, quote, dancing clubs, missionary societies, and rifle clubs. White resistance undermined attempts to empower the blacks politically. The white South, for many decades, openly flouted the 14th and 15th Amendments. Wholesale disenfranchisement of blacks, starting conspicuously in about 1890, was achieved by intimidation, fraud, and trickery. Among many various underhanded schemes were the literacy tests, unfairly administered by whites to the advantage of the illiterate whites. Sorry, to the advantage of the illiterate whites. In the eyes of the white Southerners, the goal of white supremacy fully justified these dishonorable devices. So they kind of allowed the white guys who couldn't read the vote, and they wouldn't allow the blacks who couldn't read the vote. <clears throat> Johnson walks the impeachment plank. Radicals, meanwhile, had been sharpening their hatchets for President Johnson. Annoyed by the obstruction of the drunken tailor in the White House, they falsely accused him of maintaining there a harem of dissolute women. Not content with curbing his authority, they decided to remove him altogether by constitutional processes. Under existing law, the president pro tempore of the Senate, the unscrupulous and rabidly radical Bluff Ben Wade of Ohio, would then become president. As an initial step, Congress in 1867 passed the Tenure of Office Act, as usual, over Johnson's veto. Contrary to precedent, the new law required the president to secure the consent of the Senate before he could remove his appointees once they had been approved by that body. One purpose was to freeze into the cabinet the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, a holdover from Lincoln's administration. Although outwardly loyal to Johnson, he was secretly serving as a spy and informer for the radicals. Johnson proved the radicals provided the radicals with a pretext to begin impeachment proceedings when he abruptly dismissed Stanton early in 1868. The House of Representatives immediately voted 126 to 47 to impeach Johnson for high crimes and misdemeanors, as required by the Constitution, charging him with various violations of the Tenure of Office Act. Two additional articles related to Johnson's verbal assaults on the Congress involving disgrace, ridicule, hatred, contempt, and reproach. A not guilty verdict for Johnson. With evident zeal, the radical-led Senate now sat as, uh, as a court to try Johnson on the dubious impeachment charges. The House conducted the prosecution. The trial aroused intense public interest, and with 1,000 tickets printed, it proved to be the biggest show of 1868. Johnson kept his dignity and sobriety and maintained a discreet silence. His battery of attorneys argued that the president, convinced that the Tenure of Office Act was unconstitutional, had fired Stan merely to put a test case before the Supreme Court. That slow-moving tribunal finally ruled indirectly in Johnson's favor 58 years later. House prosecutors, including the oil-tongued Benjamin Butler and embittered Thaddeus Stevens, had a harder time building a compelling case for impeachment. On May 16, 1868, the day for the first voting in the Senate, the tension was electric and heavy breathing could be heard in the galleries. By a margin of only one vote, the radicals failed to muster the two-thirds majority for Johnson's removal. Seven independent-minded Republican senators, courageously putting country above party, voted not guilty. Several factors shaped the outcome. Fears of creating a destabilizing precedent played a role, as did principled opposition to abusing the constitutional mechanism of checks and balances. Political considerations also figured conspicuously. As the vice presidency remained vacant under Johnson, his successor would have been the radical Republican Ben Wade, the president pro tempe of the Senate. Wade was disliked by many members of the business community for his high-tariff, soft-money, pro-labor views, and distrusted them more by more moderate Republicans. Meanwhile, Johnson indicated through his attorney that he would stop obstructing Republican policies in return for remaining in office. Diehard radicals were infuriated by their failure to muster a two-thirds majority for Johnson's removal. The country is going to the devil, cried the crippled Stevens as he was carried from the hall. But the nation, though violently aroused, accepted the verdict with a good temper that did, did credit to his political maturity, to its, the country's political maturity. 
In a less stable republic, an armed uprising might have erupted against the president. The nation thus narrowly avoided a dangerous precedent that would have gravely weakened one of the three branches of the federal government. Johnson was clearly guilty of bad speeches, bad judgment, and bad temper, but not of high crimes and misdemeanors. From the standpoint of the radicals, his greatest crime had been to stand inflexibly in their path. Purchase of Alaska Johnson's administration, though largely reduced to a figurehead, achieved his most enduring success in the field of foreign relations. The Russians, by 1867, were in a mood to sell the vast and chilly expanse of land now known as Alaska. They had already overextended themselves in North America, and they saw it in the likely event of another war with Britain, they would probably lose their defenseless northern province to the sea-dominant British. Alaska, moreover, had been ruthlessly furred out and was growing an economic liability. The Russians were therefore quite eager to unload their frozen assets on the Americans, and they put out seductive feelers, seductive feelers in Washington. They preferred the United States to any other purchaser, primarily because they wanted to strengthen further the Republic as a barrier against their ancient enemy, Britain. In 1867, Secretary of State William Seward, an ardent expansionist, signed a treaty with Russia that transferred Alaska to the United States for the bargain price of $7.2 million. But Seward's enthusiasm for these frigid wastes was not shared by his ignorant or uninformed countrymen, who jeered at Seward's folly and Seward's icebox, uh, Frigidia and Walrussia. The American people, still preoccupied with Reconstruction and other internal vexations, were economy-minded and anti-expansionist. Then why did Congress and the American public sanction for the Persians? For one thing, Russia, along, along, alone among the powers, had been conspicuously friendly to the North during the recent Civil War. Americans did not feel that they should offend their great and good friend, the Tsar, by hurling his walrus-covered icebergs back in his face. Besides, the territory was rumored to be teeming with furs, fish, and gold, and it might yet pan out profitability, as it did later with natural resources, including oil and gas. So Congress and the country accepted Seward's polar, polar bear garden, somewhat derisively, but nevertheless, hopefully. The Heritage of Reconstruction Many white Southerners regarded Reconstruction as a more grievous wound than the war itself. It left a festering scar that would take generations to heal. They resented the appending of their social and racial system, political empowerment of blacks, and the insult of the federal intervention in their local affairs. Yet few rebellions have ended with victors sitting down to a love, fe a love feast with the vanquished. Given the explosiveness of the issues that had caused the war and the bitterness of the fighting, the wonder is that Reconstruction was not far harsher than it was. The fact is that Lincoln, Johnson, and most Republicans had no clear picture at the war's end of what federal policy toward the South should be. Policymakers groped for the right policies, influenced as much by Southern responses to defeat and emancipation as by any plans of their own to impose a specific program on the South. The Republicans acted from a mixture of idealism and political expediency. They wanted both to protect the freed slaves and to promote the fortunes of the Republican Party. In the end, their efforts backfired badly. Reconstruction conferred only fleeting benefits on the blacks and virtually extinguished the Republican Party in the South for nearly 100 years. Moderate Republicans never fully appreciated the extensive efforts necessary to make the freed slaves completely independent citizens, nor the lengths to which Southern whites would go to preserve their system of racial dominance. Had Thaddeus Stevens's program, uh, radical program of drastic economic reforms and heftier protection of political rights been enacted, things might well have been different. But deep-seated racism, ingrained American resistance to tampering with image property rights, and rigid loyalty to the principle of local self-government, combined with spreading indifference to the North, to the plight of the blacks, formed too formidable an obstacle. Despite good intentions by Republicans, the Old South was in many ways more resurrected than reconstructed. I think it's worth actually reading the little box of uh, quotes above Frederick Douglass there. He wrote in 1882, so about 20 years later, Though slavery was abolished, the wrongs of my people were not ended. Though they were not slaves, they were not yet quite free. No man can truly be free whose liberty is dependent upon the thought, feeling, and action of others, and who has himself no means in his own hands for guarding, protecting, defending, and maintaining that liberty. Yet the Negro after his emancipation was precisely in this state of destitution. He was free from the individual master, but the slave of society. He had neither money, property, nor friends. He was free from the old plantation, but he had nothing but the dusty road under his feet. He was free from the old quarter that once gave him shelter, but a slave to the rains of summer and the frosts of winter. He was, in a word, literally turned loose, naked, hungry, and destitute to the open sky.